Well, won't be so formal, but I have set up a little reading. Uh, just for the sake of the fact that they're recording, I'll give a very teeny sort of not bio about me, but just my writing stuff. And I've published seven books of poetry, uh, the last of which, uh, The Light That Puts an End to Dreams, was a finalist in the Publishing Triangle Audrey Lord competition. Um, a memoir, America's Child, A Woman's Journey Through the Radical 60s that was reviewed in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, uh, not magazine, the book review, uh, as well as Publishers Weekly and other places, um, a book of short fiction, a play, uh, I did an adaptation of a play, Shango de Ima, from Spanish uh, by Cuban author Pepe Carril, who asked me to translate it. And uh, that was published by Doubleday and ran for a year at the New York Rican Poets Cafe and then at a bunch of different colleges and places. And a book of essays and poems, The Color of the Heart, uh, some awards from New York State Council in the Arts, plus I edited Icon Magazine for several years and was poetry editor for a while on The Nation and The Village Voice. So that's just for the recording of the video in case anybody from outside sees it. So what I've done is I've made some poems that I, I, I could screen share all of them, but I would like to start by just reading a poem without screen sharing it so that I can see you because I keep it on gallery view so that I can see you and that you can see me and not a piece of paper with some words on it. And then some of the other poems I'll screen share with you on and off. Anyway, this is called A Poem That Starts in Winter. I also wanted to say how happy I am to finally be able to share your work with you. I consider you dear friends and it means a lot to me. A poem that starts in winter. This is a poem for people without a history, whatever their color, whatever their race, who can't remember their mother ever holding them, talking to them about their past, who find themselves in unknown places, without instructions and without a guide. This is a poem for the children of immigrants whose parents wanted so much to forget, to leave behind the places they were born, the places they fled. They never spoke of those days to their children, never even told them their grandparents' names, who died leaving their children lost and restless, rootless, hungry. This is a poem that starts in winter but never ends, a poem about people, about individuals with specific features, proper names. This is a poem for Sarah, whose mother was Jewish, but no one could tell. She had blonde hair, blue eyes. It was 1939. She taught Sarah a lesson about vision, how to make people see past you, how to hide. In moments of doubt, they would always throw it in your face. You could count on it, dirty Jew. This is a poem about words. This is a poem about Sarah's mother, who never stepped inside a synagogue after the age of eight, who never forgave her own parents for what she was born, an immigrant, poor, who lived her contradictions until the day she died who left her lie behind her, a legacy drawn in her mother's face. This is a poem for Sarah's mother, a poem about words. This is a poem for Barbara, 1961, whose father warned her if she was involved with those radicals at Berkeley, those reds, he would be the first to give her name to the FBI to turn her in. She never doubted he was serious. She learned that day never to trust and never to speak. This is a poem about trust. This is a poem for Carol who cried out in shame, discovering her ancestors had killed and robbed to gain a country. Carol who had a history she no longer wished to claim. 
This is a poem for a Vietnamese poet, Havana, 1969, who praised three young Americans for their courage, standing against their own country, their own people, for what they felt right. He had no choice, was forced to fight, no virtue in that. They thought him too generous, mistaken at best, but still it helped, but still it healed. It was winter then too. This is a poem about digging images from rage when all else fails, when there is no common past and anger embedded so deeply it survives. This is a poem about war. This is a poem for Brenda who fell in love with a woman years before it became a political act, who decades later still stumbles over words long forbidden, jealous of those who proclaim their love nonchalantly, lesbian. This is a poem for Brenda. This is a poem about words, a poem about winter, a poem about war. This is a poem for those caught between worlds, squeezed between times, for people without a history who connect with no ancestral past. This is a poem about them, about me. This is a poem about words like dialogue, compassion, which have yet to appear, but people this poem about war, contradiction, rage, choice, anger, trust. This is a poem that starts in winter, but never ends. This is a poem about people, individuals with specific features, proper names. Okay. All right, the rest are a little shorter. Um, so I'm going to switch now to a love poem. And this is a different kind of poem and it, it has a lot of images. I really like this poem myself because I, I like the images. And uh, I mentioned 30 years ago, it was actually more than 30 years ago now. <laughs> so this is a love poem. Oh, and I'm going to screen share this one. Okay. There we go. You should all be able to see the poem. And I can, okay. There was a woman once who was more to me than words, any blending of alphabet and sound. We met at the corners of day in the space where night crosses light, where shadows fold into darkness. The moments between our meetings were air. 30 years lie between her and this poem, a length of time impossible to render. There was a woman once who was more to me than imagination, wonder, the chimeras that embrace the night, more than the chill kiss of wind that tortured her secret into patterns of light and breeze, a woman who was more to me than forever, the bending of syllable and time. We met on a hilltop in Vermont, made love in the sweetness of our desire. These are moments that defy forgetting. These are moments time cannot cure with detail, noise, distraction, mornings that bound us sticky and tight with dew. There was a woman once who was more to me than flesh. We touched to open and then once again to close the way a negative is held over wary eyes to keep the sun from blinding in the madness of its fire. What lay between us was that strong. What joined us was that fierce lying in each other's arms. Married, she had never meant for us to happen, had seen me as diversion, a momentary lapse. Now she called me treasure promised to keep me always cherished, hidden in her private place. But forever is the length of time like any other. One afternoon, precisely at the stroke of one, she lapsed into a silence without boundary. The air lay like a tomb around us, 
She could not look at me, touch me, say my name. She had never meant it to go so far. It had become too much for her to bear. This woman who meant more to me than words. Should I be grateful? Thank whatever gods or goddesses gifted me this passion, this legacy I cannot relinquish, cast aside. Forever is a length of time without forgiveness. After 30 years, I search for her no longer. But for that moment between opening and distance, when I held her close, not yet knowing enough to turn away. Uh, okay, so that's love poem. Get that one off. I'm just taking these off the screen as I read them. The next poem is also a love poem, and it's one that I was really honored to read at one of our gatherings of the queer group and the gay black men's queer group uh, for one of their evenings. It's an early poem. I mean, I wrote it a long time ago in my tw 20s, I think. Anyway, uh, this one doesn't need to be screen shared. It's called Duration. Many nights I waited, many years, the word slow in coming. Often I called, there was seldom an answer. The magic beneath my feet, at my fingers, often I dreamed to find truth different from the dream. Many nights I waited, many years, until the words came, their form like the earth, beautiful in their face. To understand is to know in just what way I walked, the dream that drove me forward, that rests with me still. My friend, as I reach to touch you, so still you are, so near. There is a truth the mirror cannot tell. To understand the dream, to hold it close as hands, as eyes. When it is so cold, the fingers grow chill. When there is no speech, because the stillness must not be broken. When even poems must cease. If I could give you anything, I would give you this dream in its contradiction, in its truth, how in action it changes, what in action it means, how the earth opens her body almost as an act of grace. Okay. And that leads into another one of my, my personal favorite poems. In 1970s, in the early 70s, uh, I made a trip to Chile when Allende was in power. And I had a friend here in New York who was Chilean and loved the uh, folk music of Villa Tapara, who's becoming a little bit more known here. Uh, a wonderful uh, singer who uh, was very political and was kind of caught in that grind a bind between being political and being artistic that can sometimes happen and was put down by the artistic community at the time because she was so political. And, uh, although her music, most of it is not political music. She's wonderful. She died a few years uh, before that. And she has this album first and last, um, first and last songs. And when I came back from Chile, I'm going to share this poem, but when I came back from Chile, I wrote this poem, and it was almost prophetic in a sense, because it was right before the coup. The only thing I want to mention to you, which happened on September 11th, by the way, 1973, was the Chilean coup, is that when I talk about the mountains, like my own, like home. I'm talking about California, not New York. I grew up in California. But then the description where I talk about a country of smell of wine. When you wake up in the morning in, in Chile, you smell the wine, at least um, when 
the time of year I was there, which was their summer. So, and then the italicized part is supposed to be her speaking. Okay, let me share this. Oh, first and last share. Okay, there you got it. Okay. First and last poems for Violetta Parra. There is nothing romantic about death about pain, tears falling like soft clouds, like copper clouds, the color of rusted blood, the texture of fire. The first enemy is fear, the second power, the third old age. All my life, all those books, all those feelings, words, thoughts, experiences, to say such simple words, to feel such simple things. Your mountains, like my own, like home, rows of dust, of light brown soil, as if a gentle wind could level them, could blow them away. The sea touching my nostrils, filling them, a country of smell, of sound, of wine, flowers, of salt air, of early morning, opening and opening through my mind, my heart, the extremities of my hands, my feet. If I were a bird and could float, dipping and weaving tapestries of air and light, if we could fly together like silver crows, birds of dream, until everything stops, is silent and gentle, like your songs, your voice, but the world allows us nothing, the world is nerves, is fiber, dust and sand. The world changes constantly. Nothing remains the same. I see you singing into the air as if your voice could fly, be free. Were there creatures above you listening, fishing your gifts from the breeze? Was there a place that could hold you as you opened yourself to it, as you went where no one else could follow? where no one else could see. Each time I have loved, I have left part of myself behind. Until now, I am mostly memory, mostly dream. What I have left, I give to you, my last love, my last song, the total of all I have ever felt or known. We grow smaller as we grow, as things empty themselves of us and we of them. It is so deep, this thing between us. No name can contain it. Even time trembles at its touch. Uh, all right. Okay, let me get this poem. I'm going to lead into some political-ish poems. Well, they're political. This one... This one's called Migration. And I got so sick and tired of these books and this idolization of artists having to be crazy and dope addicts and drunks. And uh, I mean, it's fine if you have a problem, but this was an idolization. Like you almost had to do this in order to be like Charles Bukowski, if any of you know Bukowski, or even Kerouac you know, this kind of on the road. So I wrote this poem and I'm gonna just read, it's a short poem. It's called Migration. Birds fly south, chained to the wind. They are wild, not free. There is a difference. They move without reflection, choice, driven by instincts they cannot begin to understand. What use are words against such need? I thought I could lose myself in wings, but I am held by memory, desire, imagined futures, citizens of air, of water, earth, and sea. We are sisters and brothers bound together by a destination that calls us in our blood, but only I can turn around, fly north, change direction, return again, 
fly south into the wind. <laughs> so that was my little answer. Okay. This is a poem called Border Guards. And you know, it's interesting. I'm going to uh, screen share this one. It's interesting because I think it's interesting. I always say it's interesting, but um, I wrote it originally about immigration and about the border. But in a sense, I think now it becomes very relevant in terms of all of these lines that we're drawing around everything. So in a sense, I think it's more, it still has that, of course, meaning, but I think it, it has even more connotations now. Uh, screen share. I just have to move this over. Okay, border guard share. Okay. Border guards. There are lines drawn in the sand that must never be crossed. So say the pundits, the arbiters of boundaries, definitions of what should or should not be said or done. There are lines drawn on maps around cities, boroughs, neighborhoods, blocks, houses, the people who live in them. There are lines drawn around nations, lines teeming with people waiting to get in or out. There are lines drawn around individuals, ethnic, racial, tribal lines around genders, he, she, you, me, they, them a demarcation of countries, cultures, continents. There are lines drawn around hemispheres, north, south, east, west, around the earth itself. There are longitude lines, latitude lines. The Tropic of Capricorn is a line, the Tropic of Cancer, the earth as it circles space as we delineate the seasons. A child takes a crayon, weighs it carefully in her palm. It is yellow, the color of the sun or of her dreams, places she sees in the pictures she thumbs through at night, her fingers scrolling color across paper, purple, then blue, an ocean, then fire blazing orange and subtle green trees, flowers, objects without set form, only she knows what they mean. Lines of memory are like that, vivid, weightless, ghost images without net boundary. Cezanne, seeing a forest of trees come into being in the dawning sun, paints them obsessively, branches, leaves undulating out of birthing light as they come alive in front of his discerning eyes. All this is not to say we do not need to name things, identify them ourselves. But where exactly are these boundaries, borders, guarded so carefully with passports, rules, and laws? I can't see them. Can you? These lines that label us, define us, separate us, these lines that must never be crossed. Uh, okay. This is a, a newer poem. It, Word of Guards was, isn't in the book. And this one isn't either. I was thinking, you know, we, we live on a globe, right? And which means, and also what people don't realize a lot of them is when they shoot a rocket up into space, it's not like you drive a car 
and it goes further because you keep putting the gas on. What that powerful thrust does is eliminate, oh God, it's the UPS man. Okay, this will give you a pause to breathe. I just have to open the door. What a gift this is. Yeah, a brilliant, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. So emotional, I had to walk away. Oh, what a, what a gift. I've, I've read these poems and they were wonderful being read, but it is so good to hear her read them. Thank yeah. you, I came back to hear that. Luckily, you didn't ring the bell in the middle of a poem. Thank you very much, UPS, I'll have to send them a note. It's good to take a little pause anyway. This poem, anyway, I was talking about the globe and the fact that the thrust re actually pushes the rocket so that it, it leaves the gravity. It escapes, actually escapes the Earth's gravity, and then it falls. That's why they call it free fall. It's actually falling in space because it's just a concept we can't grasp is that where we are is not standing upright. You know, we could be, depending on what country you're in and where you are in the globe, you could be standing sideways, you could be standing upside down. It's something you don't really think about, but all of us think we're standing upright. And we are relative to ourselves. So anyway, I, I was just thinking about this and I wrote this poem every which way, which I don't need to um, just put on the screen share for you. It's called Every Which Way. Imagine a globe spinning through space. You're standing in Canada. The stars are singularly bright. You watch them in silence. You're standing in China. Bikers struggle through crowded streets, pollution so dense it obscures the light. You're standing in Spain. It is summer. The sun burns your flesh as you reach toward your daughter's hand. You are standing in Africa. The Serengeti is quiet. Predators wait for night. You are standing in Antarctica, the sky dimming in preparation for winter's long sleep. You are standing at the North Pole or in a big city, Calcutta perhaps, or Moscow, Buenos Aires, New York. You are standing in the suburbs, on the plains, on an island. Do you ever think it curious, no matter where you are, freed of gravity, you will fall into space? Perhaps even now you slant at a 90 degree angle, or worse, with your head hanging permanently down. How athletic to be stretched out sideways, rigid as a board. What determination to remain the wrong way round, the soles of your feet where your head should be. Have you ever considered how distorted our perception of who we are, how we are placed might be, when we are, all of us, standing every which way but up? <laughs> Oh, this is a longer poem. Um, just want to look at some. I have other poems. I was just going to read two more poems. There's some time, but I feel like the poems, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, I've got two more. One is longer, and then one is really short. And I might stick one other short one in. And then we can just talk. Okay, this is, uh, I should probably screen share this one. I was in Cuba in uh, 1968, 1969 again, and then in 1990, 
When I came back from Cuba in 1968, I was there for a cultural congress, not a guerrilla training camp, a cultural congress. And uh, Sir Herbert Reed was there, Godard was there. Um, there were a lot of wonderful writers and, and also people that were educators were considered cultural people. It's too bad we don't consider educators cultural people either. So it was a big conference and I went down there as a representative from Icon Magazine, which I forgot to mention that I, I, I don't remember if I mentioned that I found, co-founded and edited Icon Magazine, which is a wonderful literary magazine for a number of years. I can say wonderful because the people that were in it were wonderful. Um, when I got back, I hadn't been political in the sense of being with a capital P. I mean, I was, walked in anti-war marches and things like that and you know did anti-racism work and stuff but i wasn't i considered myself an artist who was on the side political in those days anyway when i came back from cuba i got trounced and uh, i lost my job the magazine's distribution was cut off I wound up getting an ulcer. I was working full time. And at the night I was doing layout. Usually the, the people that did the layout on the, the magazine staff left, they walked off the magazine. They got scared and I sort of realized why. I mean, people don't realize what it was like in the sixties here. And um, so I wound up doing not only the editorial part of the magazine, but doing the graphics, which stood me in good stead because I learned how to do graphics. And when I lost my job, I got a job doing graphics and typesetting. Consequently, I got an ulcer and I was very sick. I didn't have health insurance. And the doctors told me that um, if I had had health insurance, that he would see me every couple of weeks. But in the meantime, since I didn't, he gave me a little bottle of probanthine and phenobarbital and said, take these three times a day. And if you get an extreme pain again, because I had been when it first happened, go to the emergency room, because if it perforates, it can kill you, you know, if you start bleeding. So anyway, they heard about this in Cuba and they um, told me to come back and they put me in the hospital there for a month. But this is the poem that I wrote for Margaret Randall, who edited a fabulous magazine called El Cuento Emplumado. I'm talking a little also to give a little pause. And um, I was so moved and shaken by that trip to Cuba because I it was like I can't tell you it was like when I came back to the United States it was like somebody had stripped a veil off my eyes and I saw things that I'd never seen I saw them but I didn't see them it's like if you walk past somebody that's homeless I realized a lot of people don't see those people and I didn't to be honest, you see them, but you don't see them. Just like when I see people with canes now, I see them. Whereas before I saw them, but didn't really see them. And uh, so there was a really big culture shock. So, and I couldn't speak about my trip. It's like people would have said to me, the ones that wanted to hear, a lot of them didn't want to hear about it. It was so, I called Margaret who lives in, who lived in Mexico then. And after speaking to her, I was able to sit down and write this poem. And of course, the poems don't just come out of me. I edit them and spend a lot of time. So this is called Reminiscences for Cuba and for Meg. And let me share the screen on this. Uh, one good thing about teaching on Zoom for a year and a half. <laughs> I learned how to do Zoom, right? Okay, reminiscences for Cuba and for Meg. Speaking to you, I was reminded of those weeks, how far they seem, distant and yet how strong speaking to you. Words fail me now. 
Often I sit for hours without speech, images stray through my mind, songs, as I work a feeling of hunger and then of pain. Sometimes, no often, it is harder to remember, and then on the faces, I discover it in the streets as I walk, learning to look out boldly into those eyes. It is not despair that turns them away, but hope. You asked why, and that is the answer. Refusing solace, refusing their dark places, their tombs. I sicken of those eyes, their sharp edges, their wit. I sicken of the sophistication of those eyes. By their death, they remind me, as those others did that winter so few weeks ago. We spoke together then, as they did by their life. It is the poem, it is the song that has meaning. I heard them sing. We heard them in their winter, their hands, their voices. The song is the poem, its words strong. And behind the words, the meaning, the syllables, the depth. There is this pain inside me. For years now, I have known it, this pain, this companion of mine. It reduces things cleverly, this friend. What is greater than I, it croons to me, it sings to me. What is greater than I, there are things greater, good, 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 good. What are they? What is more important than this pain? How cleverly it reduces things, this ache in my side. And those weeks made it deeper. I know now what caused it and that it will never leave. It reminded me your voice of those days, the sea outside my window. I could never live long beyond the reach of sea, at least sensing it there around me, its song, even its silence. Always I have lived near water and there it surrounded me. The East River is not an ocean, is not beautiful like that sea, does not break against the streets, furious and then calm, but it is water and every now and then a boat passes and the stillness of it, even the darkness sometimes, and I see into it as one looks into water with the backs of the eye. It is not finished, is never over, repeating again and again, each time holding the balance, tipping it forward. The revolution is for people, they said, but it was not their words, it was them, the way they were, the way they spoke. It was as hard to carry as water. And now months later, I have begun to live, to speak the change, the words written in blood, in pain, you could scream it in the streets, and who would listen? But the scream remains, the sound of it, like the sound of your voice and those others, like their memory, like water, changing as it flows. Okay, I'm just going to uh, read one short poem. That's enough. Uh, I want to finish with this poem because, and I want to dedicate it to our group. It's a very short poem. And I'll put, I'll share screen with this. So this is for us since. Uh, There is something called longing, so fragile it must never be spoken. The wind leaves its mark with invisible palms. The face of the wind is silence. But all this is a facade for something so simple it defies definition. The world is terrible, huge, beyond our control. As babies, we knew it. As adults, we had to pretend to forget. Longing is part of remembering. And so we declare independence, think we have got it beat, think it no longer matters. Yet we must fight the distance with what sustenance but each other. Okay.
trying to find the stop share. Okay. That's okay. Again, thank you very much for allowing me the honor of sharing my work with you today.